This video was brought to you by Nebula. There's a lot wrong with the UK property market. Building property is impossible, buying property is inordinately expensive, and renting property is both expensive and miserable. However, one of the things that makes the UK's property market unequivocally bad is the presence of leaseholds, a British idiosyncrasy that basically means that millions of Brits who think they own their homes outright, in fact, merely own a lease to live on the land for a finite amount of time, leaving them at the mercy of the so-called freeholder, who effectively acts as an inconvenient landlord. Now, this is a problem that even the Tories now recognise, which is why last year the government proposed to abolish the system and introduce the Leasehold and Freehold Reform Bill. So in this video, we're going to explain what leaseholds are, why people don't like them, and what the new bill will do to address them. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So the first thing we really need to do is explain what a leasehold is. In short, a leasehold is a form of property ownership whereby the occupier essentially buys the right to live in the property for a certain period of time, but the building itself or the land it's built on is still owned by someone else, known as the freeholder. Now, if you're one of our international viewers, this might sound a bit weird, and that would be because England and Wales are literally the last two countries in the developed world where leaseholds are still widely used. Today, there are around 5 million leaseholds in the UK, including the vast majority of flats in urban areas, which represent about 20% of the English housing stock. In basically every other country in the world, you either buy your property outright, or if you buy, say, a flat in a larger block of flats, you buy what's known in the UK as a common hold, i.e. you and the other residents are jointly responsible for the overall building rather than some third-party freeholders. Now, despite being a little bit odd, for most of recent history, the system worked relatively well. Freeholders generally didn't charge exorbitant fees, and the leases offered were usually so long in tens if not hundreds of years that the buyers didn't really worry about renewing or negotiating them. In fact, today most prospective buyers treat leaseholds and freeholds as nearly identical, which is why leasehold properties sell for basically the same amount as their freehold equivalents. The point we're making here is that leasehold is widely considered a normal form of property ownership in England and Wales, even though it's in some ways a lot more like a long-term rental. However, despite this, the system has always been ripe for abuse, for the simple reason that freeholders can exploit the fact that they can extract massive rents from leaseholders. This is both because no one really wants to leave their home, but also because selling your leasehold is almost impossible if there's an ongoing dispute with the freeholder. So if your freeholder imposes some massive costs and you resist or refuse them, then it's likely you can't even sell your house to get away from it all. Now, leaseholder abuse first became a politically salient problem in the 1990s, after leaseholds had taken off in the late to mid 20th century, with the vast expansion of dense blocks of flats in cities. Now, often for simplicity, individual flat owners were sold leaseholds rather than freeholds, and developers or some other institution maintained control of the freehold. However, at the end of the millennium, stories started appearing about freeholders charging exorbitant ground rents and service charges, which leaseholders weren't consulted on and couldn't really resist. Many leaseholders today complain that freeholders behave as landlords when it suits them, i.e. freeholders justify their exorbitant service costs on the grounds that they're acting as diligent landlords. But whenever work actually needs doing on the property, they tell the leaseholders that it's their responsibility because they're the homeowner. And this has all become a real issue since the Grenfell Tower disaster, after the government introduced new fire safety and cladding regulations for blocks of flats. In many cases, the freeholders of the effective blocks have either tried to pass on the entire cost to the leaseholders or just refused to do the work, leaving leaseholders effectively unable to sell their now unsafe properties. And to make matters worse, more recently developers have even started building more leasehold houses, which obviously makes even less sense than flats, given that there's not even any communal space, with hidden and onerous ground rents snuck into these homes. 
A common one is for a ground rent that doubles every five to ten years, which might not sound that bad, but for anyone who's familiar with exponential growth knows that doubling every five years means that your ground rent would go up more than 3,000% over 25 years, and that makes it very difficult to sell this type of property. For all of these reasons, leaseholds have become increasingly unpopular, and polling suggests that something like 57% of leaseholders today regret buying a leasehold property. You get the idea then. Leaseholds are British anomalies that have become increasingly controversial in the past few years. And perhaps as a result, support for reform now interestingly crosses the entire political spectrum. Labour and the left see the leasehold system as basically a neo-feudal con, a mechanism for perpetuating class inequality by denying real ownership to aspiring homeowners and keeping actual control in the hands of a few moneyed landowners. But many Tories also feel uncomfortable with the current system. Some moderate conservatives oppose leaseholds on similar grounds, but even many right-wing Tories who might not share Labour's anxiety about inequality are also wary of leaseholds. For starters, they're distinctly anti-Thatcherite. Thatcher famously believed in the so-called property-owning democracy, and that widespread home ownership was the best protection against the dangers of socialism, because giving people capital in the form of property was the best way of turning them into capitalists. On top of that, many free market Tories think that leaseholds look suspiciously monopolistic. Leaseholders are sort of captive consumers who can't shop around for alternatives, and freeholds are generally pretty difficult to buy, i.e. there's high barriers to entry. Anyway, this is why last year Michael Gove announced that the government wanted to abolish the leasehold system, which he described as feudal. However, when the much-anticipated leasehold and freehold bill was introduced to Parliament in November, it fell conspicuously short of Gove's rhetoric. In its current form, the bill would ban new leasehold houses, but not new leasehold flats, and essentially make it easier for existing leaseholders to renew their leases or renegotiate better terms. Now, the government's argument for these more modest reforms is that retroactively amending leaseholds would require breaking pre-existing contracts between leaseholders and freeholders, and that common holds aren't necessarily a better option than leaseholds, because, as anyone who lives in a shared building will know, coordinating works and repairs with your neighbours can be pretty difficult. Nonetheless, Labour aren't convinced, and they've pledged to bring forward legislation within the first 100 days of a Labour government which would, quote, replace private leasehold flats with a workable commonhold solution, and ban both new leasehold houses and flats. Now, given the polls, this means that, unless the Lords amend the current bill to make it happen earlier, leaseholds are probably going to be scrapped soon after the next election. And this is probably good news, both in and of itself, and because it's a symptom of the fact that politicians are finally devoting political capital to the raging housing crisis. There's definitely going to be new developments with this story though, so keep an eye out for future changes. Actually, the best way to stay on top of the news is with Nebula News. If you haven't heard, we've just launched a project alongside our partners at Nebula called Nebula News, where every day the TLDR team curates a selection of videos that matter the most in the world right now. As you surely already know, Nebula is the thoughtful streaming service that's pushing boundaries on what independent creators can do with their content, including Nebula News, where we handpick a feed of content that should help you keep up to date with everything you need to sound smart and be truly informed. We believe that in a confusing and overwhelming news environment, knowing what to pay attention to is important. You can't track every story, so our curation should help to surface what really matters. Showing you videos from TLDR and other superb creators that will help you understand the world around you quickly and easily. It's not just the curated news content brought to you directly by us. Nebula also features loads of exclusive original content. That's things like Real Life Law's brand new series, War Room, which every month runs you through a whole load of ongoing conflicts to keep you in the loop. You can also watch every TLDR video on Nebula ad-free, and in many instances, before they land on YouTube. Now, if you're already subscribed to Nebula, then you can find the brand new Nebula news section at nebula.tv forward slash news, and make sure to bookmark or save that link so that you can use it as your TLDRified news homepage. If you're not a member already, you can click the link in the description to sign up now. 
If you do, you'll get 40% off an annual plan by using our link. That's less than £2 a month. Plus, Nebula will know that you came from us, which really helps us out. 